Hello and welcome to the entrant. The topic for today's discussion is one of the most relevant topics under the Indian family laws. The sources and schools of Muslim law hold great importance when it comes to questions asked in competitive exams. Let us start off by understanding a little about the history of Islamic law. Unlike the personal laws of other religions, Muslim personal law in India is largely uncodified. That is, it is not based on laws made by the legislature. Instead, it originates from several other sources of traditional law dating back several years. Since the Prophet had proclaimed Muslim law to be the commandment of God, most Muslims adhere to it strictly. It dictates several spiritual, religious, social and even legal activities. It provides guidance in matters of marriage, divorce, succession, inheritance and even adoption. The sources of Muslim law can be broadly classified into primary and secondary sources. Primary sources are those sources that are based on religious beliefs mentioned in holy scriptures or books and are universally accepted by the people and shall be relied on before any other source. The Quran, Sunnah, Ijma and Kiya form the primary sources of Islamic law. Secondary sources of Islamic law have led to the development of Muslim personal laws. They include legislations, judicial decisions and customs. The Quran. The word Quran has been derived from the Arabic word Qura, which means to read. It is the original or primary source of Muslim law. All the principles, ordinances, teachings and practices of Islam are drawn from the Quran. The contents of the Quran were not written during the lifetime of the Prophet, but were presented during his lifetime in the memories of his companions. It is said to contain direct revelations of God through the Prophet Muhammad. It is due to this reason that it is the foundation of all Islamic laws. It forms the final authority on any issue related to Muslim personal laws. It is the first and legislative code of Islam. It contains verses of religious nature as well as teachings regulating human conduct. The word Sunnah means the trodden path. It is the traditions, practices and precedents of the Prophet. It is the second source of Islamic law. Traditions were considered to be injunctions of Allah in the words of the Prophet. Whenever the Quran does not explain any authority for a given rule of law, the Prophet's actions and words become the authority as it is believed that his saying derived inspiration from Allah. It is believed that even his sayings and actions derive inspiration from God. These precedents of the Prophet are Hadith and their legal deductions are Sunnah. Sunnahs consist of the spoken word, conduct as well as silence. The meaning of the term ijma is consensus, that is, the agreement between all on a particular point of fact or law. It is a concept of law made by consensus of all Islamic jurists or other persons of knowledge or skills. With the death of the Prophet, the original law-making process ended. So the questions which could not be solved either by the principles of the Quran or the Sunnah were decided by the jurists with the introduction of the institution of Ijma. In other words, the jurists with knowledge of Islam would interpret the Quran, Sunnah and the Hadith. The common opinion of the jurists on aspects that the Quran did not explain became the Ijma. This source of law is very expansive and covers many topics. It is followed by the Sunni sect, whereas the Sunnah was mostly followed and founded by the Shia Muslims. There are three kinds of Ijma. Ijma of companions, Ijma of jurists and the Ijma of the people or masses. The opinions of the companions of the Prophet was universally accepted and cannot be modified or overruled and it formed the Ijma of companions. The Ijma of jurists contain the opinions of the jurists and is believed to be the best after the opinions of the companions. The Ijma of the people or masses is given little value among the Muslim population. The term Kiya basically means an analogical deduction from the existing sources. 
The Muslim jurists refer to the Quran and the Sunnah to compare the situation and deduce an answer based on some analogy. Wherever the other sources fail to explain something, it helped in deducting interpretations. However, it can only explain or interpret the law, but it cannot change the law. Qiyas is of lesser essence because of its deductive nature. Apart from the primary sources already discussed, the following secondary sources also govern Muslim law to a limited extent. First being legislation. Although Muslim law in India is uncodified, the parliament has made some laws to regulate some Islamic practices. For example, the Muslim Personal Law, Shariat Application Act of 1937 governs marriage, succession and inheritance. The Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act 1939 is another law regulating certain cases of divorce amongst the Muslims. The second being judicial decisions. Courts in India have at several instances interpreted Muslim law in many cases. All these interpretations generally rely on the primary sources, legislation and opinions of jurists. Courts have settled many important legal anomalies using judicial interpretations. And lastly, customs. Customs are basically practices that people follow continuously for a long period of time. In fact, they follow them for so long that they obtain the status of law in some cases. Muslim law contains various customs regulating practices of people. The death of the Prophet led to chaos in the community regarding the spiritual leadership. There was disagreement as to the succession of the Imamat or the spiritual leader. This led to the split of the community into two sects, the Sunni and the Shia. The Sunni school was of the view that the Jamat should be followed, an election must be conducted and was headed by the Prophet's youngest wife. The Shia school or the minority sect wanted to appoint a successor from the Prophet's family and was headed by the Prophet's daughter. New sects developed within these schools over time. There are four major Sunni schools. The Hanafi school is named after Abu Hanifa, its founder, and governs a vast majority of Muslims all over India. It gives importance to traditions as a source of law. If placed little reliance on the mass of oral traditions and applied severe tests based on reason and analogy to find out their genuineness. The Maliki school. This school was established by Malik ibn Anas of Medina. It recognizes the traditions of companions and as far as possible, new rules should be obtained exclusively from traditions. The Shafi school. This school was founded by Ash Safi and is found in the southern part of India. It consists of the next largest group of Muslims of India. It also relied on traditions but examined them in the light of legal reasoning and logic in order to get a very balanced and systematic rule of law. He not only approved Ijma as a source of law, but also enlarged its scope. In Hanbali school, it was established by Ibn Hanbal. He rigidly adhered to traditions of the Prophet and neglected the Ijma and Qiyas. Under this school, there is no scope of private judgment in human reasoning. There are three major Shia schools, the Imamiya school. This school is also known as Ithana Ashari school. This school is further divided into two subsects, Akbari and Usuli. Akbaris are very orthodox because they follow rigidly traditions of Imams. Usulis, on the other hand, interpret the text of the Quran with reference to the practical problems of day-to-day -day life. The Ismailia school. They constitute the smallest minority group of Muslims and they are considered Ismail as their seventh Imam. The Zayadi school. It was founded by Zayd and this school incorporates some of the Sunni principles as well. I hope this video was helpful in providing a simple and clear understanding of the sources and schools of Muslim law. For any further queries, please drop your questions in the comment box below. Please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel.